right. And in the meantime, <laughs> while we're waiting for confirmation, let's full steam ahead. Elliot, hi everyone. My name is Emily, and I'm the community manager of Two Diabetes, working with Diabetes Hands Foundation. And we are here today for a live interview with psychotherapist Elliot LeBeau, who is a person with diabetes who also focuses his practice of psychothe psychotherapy on helping people who have diabetes. Elliot, the camera is on you. Welcome, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, you're welcome. First off, let's start with who are you? Tell us a bit about yourself so we know who it is that we're going to be learning from today. Um, oh, just a moment. I'm, I see you on the stream, but I don't see me. Well, I think we can see you. Let me make sure. Let me make sure in the chat room that we have confirmation. I think we've got it. Yep, folks can see you. Awesome. So my name is Elliot LeBeau. I am a psychotherapist, a certified diabetes educator, and I've had type 1 diabetes for 37 years. And I've been doing this for um, about 10 years now. I worked in a hospital setting and then started my private practice about um, four or five years ago. And my entire practice is made up of individuals who have diabetes. And I thought I knew everything there was to know about diabetes 10 years ago to come to find out like I only knew like 10% and it's been an amazing learning experience and one of my goals is to educate everyone else. Um, I think that the emotional aspect of living with diabetes has been way overlooked and my goal is to awaken or shake up the world so that everybody is aware that it is a it can be traumatic it can it brings up multiple um issues uh that related to emotions anxiety depression um not necessarily the type that keeps you on the couch but it definitely comes with a lot of emotional issues and there's physiological reasons due to shifting blood sugars as to why that happened so in my efforts, um, I try to share as much of that as I can as possible. So first off, I think this is really interesting that you started off by saying that you've had type 1 diabetes for, did you say 37 years, 38 years? I've had it um, 37 years. 37 years. So, and that when you actually started practicing in psychotherapy, working with people who had diabetes, you realized that there was a lot that you didn't know, even after having diabetes yourself for so long. Can you talk a little bit about how you think that happens for people who have diabetes and somehow there's, there can be so much about it that we, don't, that we don't know or that we don't learn, that our care providers don't tell us or that we're just not aware of? Well, I was actually just talking about that um, earlier today with one of my um, clients who is a um, mother of uh, someone who has diabetes and was I was doing a consult I was explaining that one of the reasons that we don't that we don't get information is because there is a lack of it being provided as for one piece in the hospital when you're there, it, they give you survival skills. Then when you go outside the hospital, um, you can go see a certified diabetes educator, which I recommend, um, but you're only allowed a limited amount of sessions. Um, insurance, um, Medicare, Medicaid, all of the whole system doesn't allow for preventative. And so you're left to looking for stuff on your own. And there's a lot of people who have trouble finding the stuff online, what's credible, what's not credible. 
And there's a lot of people talking in chat rooms who aren't necessarily trained. And one of the mistakes that that I made and that I find that a lot of clients who come in with lots of years tend to make is that because of the years, they assume that they know that they know everything that's going on. But one of the things is, is you're going along, you're going along, you're going along. Meanwhile, the education, the knowledge is changing so fast. Um, methods of how to count carbs have changed dramatically. There was no counting carbs when I was diagnosed. And you had to, and there was no blood testing. So it was kind of guess as you go. But wherever you start, one of the reasons that I hit that, like, oh, I've got it all under control. I know this stuff and I get the CDE, no problem. And then I started studying and it was just like, Oh, whoa, oh my God. Because even though I read research articles, I didn't read the practical stuff. Um, and there's very little research on the practical stuff because most of the money goes to a cure, which is great, but it hasn't, the focus only for the past five or 10 years has been towards living with it. Um, there's been chatter of the emotional aspects and, um, the how to manage it but I think that there is a kind of lackadaisical attitude about what needs to be passed on to um, I hate saying patience and I'm sure every person is everyone oh. like people um, so the basically every the Individuals who are living with diabetes kind of get overlooked over time from the medical community because they're so focused in other areas. Um, I'm glad it's changing, but it needs to change even more. And the biggest reason out of all of it is the information on diabetes is constantly changing, constantly having to relearn. So there were things that I thought were just like, oh, this is just normal to find out that there's better ways to do it. And it's not that a person has a bad way of doing it. They may actually be, have a great A1C, their blood sugars may be stable, but as I've found out on my journey and the more I learned, the more I changed about my own way I you know, manage my diabetes, I found out there's ways to feel physically better by making little changes here and there. Um, and so there is better. And I think a lot of people with diabetes get stuck in that, they're stuck with this horrible illness and that there can't be better. And mm -hmm. as I've been going along, it's been getting better and better and better. Um, and a lot has to do with, um, one, I have my own therapist. And, yep, and even though I don't know what um i don't they may, may not have the biggest understanding of what it is to have diabetes at least i have someone to talk to and that emotional component can be taken care of so when i'm burning out i can go and someone will listen to me and you know they don't necessarily make suggestions they don't know about if they're good therapists um Absolutely. that's the other Finding a good therapist is important. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have a, I have a therapy story from years ago when I, I was experiencing diabetes burnout um, toward the end of my college years, and I did. I only wanted to. I wanted to see a therapist. I knew that I needed it, but I only wanted to see a therapist who also had type one diabetes specifically, because I felt like no one else could possibly understand what I was feeling. And so I found someone who was a long drive away from where I was, but it felt like it was worth it. I, I found a therapist who had type 1 diabetes, and I went to her office, and I had an intake session. And she asked me exactly what I was upset about. And I said, well, I, I, I have diabetes, and I'm upset about it. And she said, so is it that you don't like 
following a diet. I was like, uh, no, I don't think that's really the crux of the issue. And she says, you don't, do you, are you afraid of checking your blood sugar? Are you afraid of fingerprint? No. She went through this list of things, very practical things. You don't like doing shots. Do you, you don't like your insulin. And I was like, seriously, I think you actually don't get what I'm <laughs> experiencing, despite the fact that you also have diabetes. And so I was shocked and appalled, and I never went back to her. So it, was, it made it really clear to me exactly what you're saying, that you have to find the right person, that it's not just about, you don't necessarily have to have the exact same experience as your therapist, but you need to find a therapist with whom you can communicate and who you feel understands you. Um, and especially in something like diabetes burnout, which so many of us experience, I think, probably cyclically. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you approach diabetes burnout with your patients. What are the kinds of things that you talk about with them? How do you kind of get at the issues and work around all of the complexities of it? Okay. Well, I first want to actually make a quick comment about what you were just talking about. Um, what that therapist wasn't doing for you is they weren't listening. They were just asking questions. They and um, diabetes focused psychotherapy is about um, it's client centered. So I don't actually know what my client's experiences are because everyone experiences diabetes in a different way. So what I do is let them tell me what's going on with them. Then I'm not guessing. And what's important in, is to get the most, someone that you feel comfortable with that, because it's a relationship. And it's one of the most personal relationships someone will have because it's the person you can tell anything to, and it just stays there. Friends may tell other friends, family members may pass on, but so there is a lack of safety when you're talking, even if they're supportive, even if it's great, but one of the things in therapy is to find the person you connect with that you feel safe and comfortable with. And it needs to be individualized to you because we are all individuals. We are not, and I actually like calling myself a diabetic because it doesn't bother me because I grew I was, I'm back in the day, but we're not all diabetics in the sense we're not a label. And so let me get on to the diabetes burnout. So diabetes burnout, and I just went on about it, how everything's individualized. And it is, so <laughs> the burnout can be coming from many areas of our life. Um, diabetes burnout can even be, you could be handling your diabetes well and not stressed out about it, but you're still burning out because work is stressing out. And it's the combination of the two that starts making a person feel overwhelmed. So it can be way beyond just the diabetes aspect. You know, when it comes to, first someone has to realize that they're actually burning out, which is hard because, you know, what is diabetes burnout? Well, it's, and that's a difficult question because it's slightly different for everybody, but essentially it feels a lot like depression. You know you have to check your blood sugar, but you don't feel like getting off the couch. And not because you haven't been getting off the couch for all those years, all of a sudden, it's like you don't have that motivation anymore. And you're just kind of, a person can kind of be paralyzed to go do that, just can't take another test. When before everything was just natural. So when the normal routine all of a sudden gets interrupted and the person ends up not taking care of their diabetes the way they used to, and it's not for the betterment of feeling better, because if someone stopped taking care of themselves the way they were, and it's, a, it's not the opposite of burnout if you actually change what you're doing to try to improve it. But when the burnout comes, 
it does have a lot of feelings like depression and anxiety is really high. And as I said, people focus on the diabetes aspect, but it can come, the burnout can come from all of it. And so when I'm working with someone, the way I help them out is we look at all the stress factors in their life. We don't just focus on the diabetes. I have people who come in for the diabetes and it's a matter of like the first session we're talking about diabetes and the rest of the sessions we're talking about the issues with their family or the problems at work because that's what's really stressing them out in combination with the diabetes. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something specifically related. Diabetes has a tendency because it's very difficult and it's a second job. If you have a second job, it's a third job. And it's a job that's um, 24 by seven. And, you know, it's something that you have to constantly keep on top of. You can, that can be the burnout alone. So there's a wide range. Of, um, so there's not one specific thing, but the key component is all of a sudden you feel a lack of motivation and you feel an anxiety and you just feel like you just can't go any further with it. And like, you're just like, like it's beating you. It really hasn't because we go in waves. We tend to, let me see if I get that on the screen. We go in waves. And the, the waves are very important because we're going to have our down times, we're going to have our up times, and that's normal, natural. It's just like it is with blood sugars. Blood sugars don't mean good or bad. It's natural for them to go up and down. So if you're beating yourself up for high blood sugars, but you're just eight and it's two hours later and you're upset because you're not back to normal, don't be upset. It's, the numbers are just guides. That's it. They're not good or bad. They don't make us good or bad. And no, that brings me to another part of going out. We're too punitive on ourselves when things don't go right. We make ourselves like we're bad because we weren't able to control something that's not controllable, just manageable. Big difference. Control means that we can have total access to every reason of why our blood sugars are out of control when we don't. There's over a hundred different factors. Um, a fight with a loved one can just shoot. Some people, it actually lowers their blood sugar and some people, it raises it. Now, one is adrenaline can pick up your heart rate and you could, and the stress levels can actually do the reverse of what doctors and all the research says. The, um, but you end up with hormone releases when you get upset, that is sugar. The only hormone that's not of that impact, people have diabetes, that's not sugar, is insulin. So, I mean, that's just one of many factors, but our emotions play a big role in it. And, you know, at the end of a tired day, well, some of you can accidentally forget to give your injection because you're just tired and human and normal. And people say, well, how can you forget it? That voice is internal and it's external from people who are watching, who really should mind their own, but that's a whole other issue. Oh, wait, because we had that, that issue of mind your own actually come up in conversation before you and I started. Um, Today, because we had a member who was asking earlier whether, before we even started, whether you would have any suggestions for someone whose family is not supportive of them in relation to their diabetes. And this is someone whose family is angry and blames them when their blood sugar gets low, but also does not want them to test, to check, sorry, to check their blood sugar. Um, in the presence of family members, because I guess fam their family members find it upsetting or gross, I don't know. Um, so this per person is having a really hard time pleasing their family. Don't, don't check your blood sugar around us and don't let it go low. 
it's a bit of a catch-22 for this person. And I think it's something that a lot of people with diabetes experience is um, sometimes our families don't get it. They're not supportive. They feel like we should be able to we should be able to manage this. How could you possibly forget to check your blood sugar or do an injection when it was needed? Um, it's a hard thing for a lot of people to understand, and so sometimes our families don't understand it. What What would you say? What do you say to somebody who is having this situation with their family and really struggling with how to manage their diabetes in the presence of their family and how to be okay with their family's acceptance or lack thereof of what they're dealing with? Well, I think the key piece is what you said just at the end of that. How can we as individuals, as human beings with normal everyday people be okay with the behavior of other people who don't get it? The, there's a tendency in families to label, even if there's no diabetes, people get labeled. So the bad child, the, the good child, the child that's gonna win the gold trophy and be first place, um, all these, the, oh, he's just being funny when, you know, cause he's been given the label, the clown. Um, so we all get these different labels. Um, in family dynamics. The problem with diabetes is that all of a sudden, because someone has diabetes, all of a sudden they, there's a tendency for the family to go to the, oh, well, they're the sick child, which is a label with or without diabetes that some children get. Even without, um, and so it's negative labels, the, not because of the child, but because of their parents. When, uh, when we're children, we don't have control at all. And we can't decide on many levels because of the parameters that the family or the parents made. A lot of times they don't know that that's what their parents did or their parents' parents did. And so parenting is something that needs to be learned, but most people don't learn it. And then you throw diabetes in the mix, which is so complicated. The parents get overwhelmed. They, they blame themselves. But what happens next becomes so complicated. The family can actually then, they're so stressed out, and they've got all this anxiety, and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to deal with it. And they actually end up, it's like, um, blaming the victim, you know, when they feel guilty, they feel like it's their fault. And I've told, had to many parents believe that they caused it when they didn't cause it. It's just something that happens. It's matter. It's not hereditary genes. It's a matter of that two people have the genes that cause diabetes. It's why you actually will see it in a family line but it's not actually um, genetic like um, cancer is. It's not hereditary. So there's an appearance that it is, but what happens is because they have, people look and see the hereditary, they look at it as if inherited. Like, so then it becomes their fault. But then if, a per, if a, your parents are human, um, siblings are human, and they're going to deal with it as best as they learn to deal with it. Many people don't learn good coping skills or how to relate, and it depends on what environment they grew up in. So if they didn't have a well-balanced, um, be independent, but yet also be dependent, you know, that right mix, um, if they didn't learn that, well, exercise is a way to relieve stress or talking is good. We talk about our feelings instead of, oh, you gotta push the feelings down. Some family, I've had some fam people who come in and they have diabetes, but they can't tell anybody because it's seen as such a weakness in their family. And so 
at the end of the day, it all comes back to how we are handle it within ourselves. So we have to make those decisions. If someone, if people don't care for seeing us um, taking our blood test and they're our family member, then how would we approach it is individualized. Some people are comfortable with just being like, well, you just have to deal with it and do it anyway, because it's not, it's not that the person who has diabetes fault. It's not their issue. See, they're displacing onto the person who has diabetes that they are squeamish about watching the blood sugar test. But really, the person who has a problem is the person who has the problem with the blood sugar test and doesn't want the person with diabetes to do it. But yet they blame the person with diabetes as though they have a choice. And they don't. What they do have a choice in is whether they take it in and hold on to those comments or they let them go over their head and just let it roll off their shoulders. Most people say they do that, but most people can't. And I don't know many human beings that can totally let something roll off their shoulder, especially when it's repetitive. And in families, it's going to be repetitive over and over and over again. So a person has to decide, just like when you're on the subway in New York City and you're on that train and that car is packed, and someone gets on the train and starts um, various things happen in New York subway trains. Uh, one thing is someone will give a sob story to the whole train asking for money, or they will be preaching to God and like the world's coming to an end. Anyone can go on a train. So a person has a choice. They can stay in that car or they can get out of that car and go sit in another train, get another car of the same train. That way they're not listening. Now, the problem always is, is, and this is see where everything in families is a lot more complex than a train, but if you don't go into the right car, then that person follows you. And so now you're listening to it again, but you at least empowered yourself to move. See, we don't always have to fight what's in front of us. We can make the choice. It's not retreating. It's not giving up. It's making a tactical move, win the battle and lose the war, or let the battle go and win the war. And the war is you, the individual, your health, your happiness. And it's so important to be an advocate for yourself, not just in the medical system, but within your own families, because we can't control who's gonna be supportive most people don't even understand, or you can even come close to understand what a chronic illness is that you have to manage. Um, even someone who has cancer can't really relate because they go into the doctor's office, they get the treatment, and then they feel sick for a while. And then if they're lucky, then it goes into remission and they've got 20 years with nothing. Well, maybe not nothing. I don't want to be like, too cold or crass or negative, but there's something unique in the way the chronic illness of diabetes is. And so it is so unique that I don't know that many people who could, can really understand what it is um, we as individuals are going through. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, as you're talking, we have a lot of questions relating to family dynamics, specifically coming up in the chat room. And I mean, it's clearly something that a lot of people with diabetes have challenges with. Um, so I want to read you a couple of those questions and get your, and get your thoughts on these. Um, one is, how do you deal with the potential resentment that siblings might have toward a person with diabetes because they get extra parental attention and concern? because of their diabetes. So these are clearly, these are parents who are engaged and are concerned and do want to be um, supportive and helpful. But if there are other siblings involved who don't have diabetes, perhaps in the end, they, they, they can sometimes feel like they're being shortchanged and there can be resentment there. Um, another, another 
question that I have here. Uh, sorry, I'm looking through. I have this long list of questions. People have a lot they want to hear from you. While you're looking through that, let me answer that one because I've got okay. Okay. that one is kind of is clear cut. So the fighting is going on with your sibling, with your brother or sister. That's not the person you you need to speak with. You need to speak with your parents. You need to say, look, we need to have equal attention. You paying so much attention to me is causing a problem with me and my brother or me and my sister. And the discussion has to be between the, parent, the person who has diabetes and the doting, caring, loving parent who is just not aware that it's causing an imbalance. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to win anything because the person's always going to feel that way as long as the parents are still doing that. You know, you can have a discussion about it, but it's still going to always feel in fear to the sibling who doesn't have diabetes. So essentially one of the things that parents need to do is to balance the equation. So if they're going to, when they're little kids and growing up with type one, if it's a parent who's listening, you know, you need to make things balanced. It's all about balance. Um, if you're going to change one person's diet, the whole family should change their diet. Someone who has diabetes tends, it's good to have a healthy diet. And it's good for children to see that because then it gets ingrained. It's much harder later in life. Um, and so, and when attention is given to one, even though it's not positive, see, that's the thing. It, when you have an absence of attention, it's worse than getting negative attention. So even if it's negative, it's still, the other person still may feel left out. Now you don't want to say, well, go yell at my brother Johnny or my, you know, my sister. <laughs> Johnny would really like to get in trouble now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the conversation needs to start with the parents. And if it's parents who are listening, you need to have a discussion if you're with whoever you're parenting with, if you're, if you're married, if you're divorced, it still has to happen because you still have the issue when they go see um, their father. So there needs to be a unity. It's a team effort. And I try to explain to my parents that they need to create a team environment so everybody feels like they have a say in what's happening because diabetes impacts everybody but not but it doesn't have to have a negative impact absolutely that, that's that, those are really interesting words of wisdom to bring the issue back to the parents um looking at some of our other questions here we have also, also relating to, to family dynamics, when an adult who has diabetes is burned out and is having trouble caring for themselves, um, how can their friends, their family, their loved ones potentially try to step in and encourage them to seek professional help, like, for example, to see a therapist? Do you have any suggestions for folks who are trying to help their family members who are having a hard time? <clears throat> oh, that's a hard question to answer because <clears throat> there's no one answer for that. It has it's individualized. <clears throat> My recommendation is if you're concerned about someone, then you need to maybe sit down and speak with a therapist and consult with a therapist, explain your concerns and tell them the situation so they got in-depth knowledge and let them help you guide you to how to get them into help because <clears throat> a lot of times 
you don't know what it is is that gonna, that's going to motivate someone who's burnt out to actually get up and go see yet another doctor. Now, therapists aren't doctors, but they're perceived as doctors because we spend so much time in the doctor's office. Who wants to go once a week to yet another, we lump it in with the doctor's appointment. The difference is it's not. The doctors tell you what you need to do and what you need, and you know, you're lucky if they listen to you. The therapist's office you're going because you're gonna get listened to, and you're gonna get that advice. So I really can't truly answer that, but one thing I can say, and I guess that could be kind of a general advice on that topic, is don't go head on. Don't say to them like, oh, you're messing up and we need to get you help. You know, you're not doing what you used to. You know, what you, a person can do is kind of slide in there and say, you know, I see you're struggling. What's wrong? Let them tell you what's wrong. And then you can slowly move, move the conversation towards, well, maybe even if they bring up the diabetes or they bring up something else, you could actually say, let's go to a therapist. If it's, if it's, about, if it's about something about managing their diabetes, you can say, oh, well, you know, there are CDEs who are educators who that's what they do. They help people figure that stuff out. How about we get you in front of a certified diabetes educator? You know, if they're so burnt out, ask them if they would mind if you would, if it was okay if you could call for them and set up the appointment. And the supportive piece would be to then go with them because it's a can be very lonely when you're burnt out. So it's a matter of gently positioning yourself where the person can open up about what they're going through. The other way is just an assumption that, oh, I see the problem, this is the problem, I've decided for you what the problem is, just like the therapist you went to in the beginning uh, when you were younger who assumed they knew what the problem was and gave you a list of yes and no, but they don't. And so, Really good support is more about listening than actually giving advice. Most people don't care for, uns for unsolicited advice. Now this, I think, I, think, I think your approach to this is, is really interesting because clearly, you know, there are, we, we talk about diabetes burnout and I think a lot of times I agree with what you're saying that a lot of us assume, you know, oh, you're, you're not taking the care of yourself that you used to. Um, so you've got diabetes burnout and you need to go talk to somebody about your diabetes. But we all know that of course it's much more complicated than that. And there are so many factors that go into our overall well being with diabetes, even more factors than without obviously. And so making that assumption that you need to go talk about your diabetes with somebody is probably not, a fair assumption. Um, but given that sort of complexity of the interplay of all the different pieces of our, of our lives, which can then affect our diabetes management and sort of add to potential overwhelm there, do you feel like the medical community and the social community around diabetes is gaining greater recognition of the importance of psychotherapy as one of the tools that can be used to help people manage their diabetes? It's something that I think a lot of our members feel has been historically lacking, that we're, you know, we're sent to doctors and we're sent to endocrinologists, and the idea that maybe we need somebody to talk to who will just listen to the experiences that we're having might actually be part of our health care. Do you think people are starting to get that concept a little more? They're starting to, but it's very slow going, and the... American Association of Diabetes Educators, which regulate what information is accurate and what's not, do have emotional health as a component. Um, but it's really about all the doctors, all the nurses, 
getting it through their head that it's not, you can't just tell someone this horrible news and expect them to go out and follow what you're telling them. That the emotional aspect needs to be solved sooner than later. Um, depending on when someone gets diabetes, um, if you have had diabetes since you were two, well, therapy may not, uh, when you first get it is not going to be like the most helpful and, and you're not going to have a sense of loss because you've lived with it your whole life. But if you get it later on, then most people have know and remember eating whatever they wanted to and the freedom of just, if they wanted to go play, they just left the house. But now if you want to go play, you got to check your blood sugar. you got to eat something. you got to make sure if your blood sugar is low, well, then maybe you shouldn't go play. Maybe you can't play. And so there's a loss of freedom. And it's a big thing that actually doesn't get talked about much, the loss of freedom. And you have to mourn the loss of freedom. And you have to go through the stages of loss, just like you would if you lost um, a family member or a loved one. It's... And it, it's somewhat deeper in some senses than if you lost a loved one because the, the loved one is you. you. You've lost a piece of you because you can no longer live the lifestyle, the freedom that you had. So someone took away, and it's not someone, it's just bad luck, really. As I said, it's not hereditary. It seems hereditary, but it's not it's that 40% of the population has the genetic component for diabetes and two people who are in that 40% have to meet. And there was a research article that, that demonstrated all of this a couple of years back. And, um, and it's very important to know that it's not, there's nothing that someone can do to uh, stop it from happening. So now you have to, you do have to, your freedom has been lost, but you have to then say, okay, well, my freedom isn't totally gone either. I could still go out and have a chocolate donut if I prepare right for it. Now, I'm not telling people to go out and have chocolate donuts every day. But Stop saying chocolate donuts. <laughs> sorry, I love chocolate donuts. I'm really donuts. hungry right now. <laughs> Just kidding. Well... Maybe. <laughs> I like I do, I do. I'm I sorry. The donuts. So, you know, I can go on the, you know, you want me to talk about chocolate donuts instead of diabetes? Well, yeah. I'm in for that. <laughs> but um, the point is, is that you can still laugh and enjoy life. It, you can still do things. You can still go hiking. You just have to prepare for it. And yes, it can be difficult. But the, it's not, you didn't lose everything. There's now just a different set of rules you have to follow. Right. The mourning of that loss still needs to happen. I think even 20 years or 30 years, if someone never went through that mourning process, deep down, it's still there. The person may still be angry at diabetes. But... Being angry, it doesn't make sense to be angry at something that isn't visible. I mean, we talk about it like it's a person or a thing. All, all that happened is our pancreas stopped producing insulin. And now we have something called diabetes. And in some cases, it's good to personalize it because vent it out on the, on the label then instead of going and venting it out on other people. But the better choice is vented out in your therapist's office. There's now like, if there's a therapist listening, they know how you think. Well, we, I, think, we I think what happens for a lot of people is that because there isn't any sort of visible target for that anger, there isn't a person to blame, right? So I think for a lot of people, it ends up being self-blame, sort of just, just because there's nowhere else, there isn't really anywhere else to look at who caused this. And so even for, even for people who don't believe I caused my own diabetes, and certainly 
there are people who are told that despite the fact that it is absolutely untrue in every case. Um, even, even for those of us who, who don't buy that, there, there still can be a level of self-damage that comes out of the, the anger that a lot of us can feel around having diabetes. So I want to actually dovetail that into another, another question that we have, which is whether one of, our, one of our chat room members asked a while ago, if you have found specific issues that exist among, uniquely among people with diabetes, and I'm, therapy issues specifically, that are things that are unique to people with diabetes um, with whom you work. Oh, if there are, okay. So there are specific issues. Um, the, a lot of times, um, hmm. yeah, that actually doesn't sound like a complicated question, but it actually is to summarize the different things that are different because as I started in the beginning, everybody's in, an individual. So, um, and everybody has different issues that may surround the diabetes. Um, sometimes, it's negative self-talk and I actually see a lot of negative self-talk more so than I do in individuals who I've worked with um, over the years who don't have diabetes. Um, the negative self-talk seems to be greater. There's a greater percentage. Um, it goes back to what people are taught, and I've written a blog about this, I've talked about it on multiple occasions, and it's one of the most simple things, but yet also one of the hardest things to get out of our heads. The fact that bad blood sugar numbers, people believe it equals that they're bad. Out of control blood sugar numbers still equates in some people's mind that they're bad. When the farthest is from the truth, the only exception, and it's not that they're bad, they may just need some help. You know, see, we look at the world as people are bad or good, it just, that's black and white, it doesn't work very well with diabetes, because diabetes is far from black and white. But we try to make it black and white, but it's not. So an individual needs help, the big piece is, get, is going and getting the help. So the negative self-talk, you know, a person can hear what I'm saying and recognize, oh, well, I can see that. Uh, if I, I do use the blood sugars to decide what I do next, because they do do that. But then there's this next thought that just comes in like immediately after, it's like, God, I can't believe I forgot this, so that happened. Or, and sometimes they didn't even forget anything. Sometimes they just believe they did something wrong. Because if they didn't do anything wrong, why would their blood sugar be 250? Well, uh, 250 is easy to prove and easy because, well, insulin takes about an hour to two hours to peak and some carbohydrates you get the full impact within you know 15 minutes so then your blood so then for the rest of the time your insulin's playing catch up and so your blood sugar stays high for a couple of hours and then eventually starts coming down it's much more complicated than that the, how the mechanisms of um, blood sugar works uh, this was some of the things i didn't know until i really dove into not only the research that I found, but my own research, um, that we have tolerance issues when our blood sugars are higher. We have to give more insulin to get it back down than we would if it was at 180. So this the equation, we give a general equation, but that equation doesn't always work out well. And sometimes people have a hard time, well, I gave the right amount, why am I not back down? And one may they they may have not waited long enough, or they have more resistance because it's 
Our insulin is designed to work on active immediate glucose. Well, that's not what you're facing. You're dealing with glucose already in the blood system. So it was never designed to take someone who has a high blood sugar and bring them down. It was designed to prevent the blood sugar from being high in the first place. So a lot's going on there. And so the numbers may not make sense because of it. Those, that's one of the other factors, how insulin works. Mm -hmm. We have imperfect tools with which to do the job. Right. But we're lucky we have the tools. Absolutely. Joss, Dr. Jocelyn would love to see what we've got today compared to what he had, which was nothing. Um, well, and when you and I were, you and I were both diagnosed uh, very, very close together in terms of time. And so you, we both, and a lot of the folks in the chat room, have had this experience as well that when we were diagnosed with diabetes there was no way to check your own blood glucose levels oh, yeah. there, was, there were syringes of course but there were no insulin pumps there were no insulin pens um, you probably like me went to the went to the hospital once a week to have a blood draw to tell you what your blood sugar had been sometime previously in the week which obviously was not very useful information at the time so all of this has changed, and it has changed, I think, the, the mental and emotional aspects of having diabetes as well. And this, this is another really big question, and we're almost out of time, so I hate to... Ugh. Can you go over just a few minutes, Elliot? Yeah, I can go over just a few minutes. I, I have a question about... You have a question for me? Yeah, about what you just said. What year was it that, you were, that they were having you go in for blood draws? I was diagnosed in 1978. You know, um, you know what? What? The consistency of what who you go to as a provider. They never did. They never told us about that. You didn't do that. No, actually, didn't even know it existed until you just said it. And that's how messed that's up. How inconsistent our education is. And that's why, and I come across so much while doing this. That's just an example of something that I would come across. Right. Um, and so not every endocrinologist is built equal. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess that punctuates the importance of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, think as, I think as the tools and the technology have, have changed, um, I think it's really changed the mental and emotional aspects of having diabetes as well. And I think, personally, I feel like there have been some trade-offs because now we're able to track things so much more closely, which is obviously a very good thing in terms of health maintenance. But emotionally, it might bring with it actually a heavier burden because we are constantly bombarded with, with sort of actionable information. Um, what do, you, what do you think of that change of the, of the emotional and mental experience of having diabetes over time because of the progress that is being made in its treatment? Well, unfortunately, it goes with the times because we are the information age, and the Internet has done that to everybody. Um, but what it does specifically for an individual who has diabetes, yes, because... Back then, you didn't know. I mean, you did know you could do the whole tablet routine and change the color and or the pee on a stick thing, and you know you knew something. But even that was totally inaccurate. So if you made any changes because of that, then you, but back then you didn't know that. So back then you still had the same stressors of, well, my blood sugars are bad. It's just now we can see it quicker. So it's easier to become a little obsessive about it and maybe higher rates of obsessive compulsive personality, not necessarily a disorder, but just a really can be over intense, which actually makes having diabetes is one of, that is one, believe it or not, that is one of the advantages. It makes us good when we go to work. Because that the same obsessiveness on the job is going Are we perfectionists? Um, well, you can't be a perfectionist if you're a human being. But 
but a lot we like to think so but it's not not just but it's thoroughness it creates a different way of thinking people who have type 1 diabetes are healthier than the average american now i know that's a loaded question um like like a big old potato loaded kind of a question so i'm not going to go there i'm just gonna that was my one reference to it but we are and even back 30 years ago we still people with diabetes if they did a study back then they did do the research on it now and we are so trade-off um we're more aware of our health we will actually end up living longer type one individuals it's a little different with um type two um that's a whole other disease um it confuses the hell out of everybody that they name diabetes and diabetes but when but needless to say um that aspect of the, of the knowledge can create extra stress and anxiety if the negative thinking i was talking about is going on then you're constantly beating yourself up because you're looking at it and the truth is, is that i've never met someone with diabetes who has had a day where it's absolute where their blood sugars and it's not designed our, our blood sugars are not designed to go straight line flat lining you know you think about it the heartbeat beats and it goes up and down up and down if it flat lines you're dead diet blood sugars were never meant to be flat lining and they go up and down in people who don't have diabetes just their safety is in place and there's two types of insulin in the human body one that works within two minutes um that takes care of the immediate food and then the one that works like we take yeah so i always see blood sugars in a wide variety i see from totally out of control to in control but in control does not mean um if you've got a dexcom or um a colored um blood glucose continuous blood glucose monitor it doesn't mean that if you're in the red you're bad it doesn't mean if you're in the yellow you're bad it just means that you're alive. It's when there's too many of those that there may be an issue. S sacrificing having three low blood sugars in a day to have an A1C of 5.9 or 6.5 is not worth the suffering. And it is a problem. So, and the same thing well, no, it's not really the same thing. Different mo motivation, fear of going low, um, which leads to a whole other issue, which, um, well, I, this would open up a can of worms, so I'd have to talk for another half hour. <laughs> so well, maybe, maybe I skip that for maybe another day. We'll save it for another talk. Um, Elliot, thank you. Thank you so much for your time here today and for being willing to go over time a little bit. This is, this is clearly a huge, huge and complex topic, the, the mental and emotional aspect of having diabetes. And as you have really clearly demonstrated, it's so different for every person. And there are so many factors involved. And there's no way to, there's no sort of single approach to figuring out how to be mentally and emotionally healthy with diabetes. And maybe that's part of why it's so hard is, you know, you can't write down instructions to follow in order to achieve mental and emotional stability and happiness and safety with diabetes. Yeah. And uh, I guess maybe that's just the human condition. Um, we, there were a lot more questions that we didn't have time to get to, but I, w I want to be respectful of your time. Well, and Yes, yes. Interrupt you and just to address that last piece. And yes, you're right. That's like 100% on. It's we're all different, and there is nothing that there are some tips that I do give, like in all of the blogs that I do and articles. And anytime someone interviews me and 
for another article, I give little bits of advice that can be, but when it comes down to it, um, the individuality is whatever their, whatever treatment a person's getting, it needs whether it's education or therapy, it needs to be specifically adjusted to the individual. It's why I actually developed diabetes-focused psychotherapy, which is um, called, it's also, it's a form. I adjusted client-centered therapy, which is what, um, I'm not going to throw out too many names, but Rogerian. Um, it's, but it's to be where the client is in the moment, to be emotionally connected, to build a relationship so that the person then feels free enough to let go and start talking about what they need to which then individualizes the treatment because what there may be other issues blocking why the man management's not going good but that won't ever come out if you get a routine like you got when you went so is it this is it that so um the only thing that i think i uh, leave on this note is that it's that i believe of course i believe a little this is where I am biased. I'm not biased when you come to see me. I'm biased when it comes to telling people that everybody should go to therapy because it's good coping. It is a coping skill. It is a coping strategy. Talking to someone who um, you feel safe and comfortable, knowing that there's no punishment is a it's unique and wonderful, and I recommend people to try it. Even the skeptics out there, should give it a try. And keep in mind that they still may end up with a therapist who is like your, ther your first therapist, but there's other therapists out there who are more, you know, important to ask, are you client centered? And if they are, most likely they'd be able to help you through the problem, even if they don't have diabetes. And on that beautiful note, thank you so much, Elliot. Folks, thank you for being here today. Thanks for your great questions and for listening and learning with me and with Elliot. And um, again, we've been speaking with Elliot LeBeau this hour, psychotherapist working specifically with people with diabetes. Elliot, you're fantastic. It's great to see you. I love your beautiful blue shirt. And, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Take good care and happy Friday. Bye-bye.